Good afternoon, everyone. So I think as everyone now admitted from the waiting room. So um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today for the very first um, edition of the Fashion Research Open Talks. Um, as I'm sure you all know that COVID-19 has greatly impacted the fashion industry. It's unlike anything we've seen before. So today in this panel discussion, the fashion academics will share their um, analysis of brands, communications and strategies across the luxury apparel and beauty industries. So just before we kick off, I'm Babette Rackett thomas I'm a fashion journalist. I'm currently based in London. And I'm going to be today's host and um, I'm joined by three academics. So. Um, if you're not a speaker, if you wouldn't mind turning off your microphone and video until the end, we will have time for some Q&As at the end. But if you have any questions throughout the talk, please feel free to use the chat box. That should all be open for you now so you can leave questions and there'll be time at the end to ask them. Um, okay, great. And just to let you all know, this, will, this is being recorded now and it will be uploaded on YouTube at a later date. So if you do have to pop out for any reason or you've had to miss any weight, you can definitely check back in and watch it. Um, great, just sorry, I'm making the last person in the waiting room. So great, so I think first it would be great to introduce to all of our listeners today our three amazing fashion academics. So would you mind introducing yourselves just briefly at what your role is, um, what you're currently doing? Anna, would you mind starting? Oh, Anna, can you hear? Hello. Oh, hi. There you go. Hi. Perfect. <laughs> hi. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, so my name is Anna Roncha. I am the course director for the Masters in Strategic Fashion Marketing at the London College of Fashion. Um, and apart from that, I'm also a researcher looking into the areas of fashion business strategy, marketing and brand strategy, and ethics and sustainability. Great. And Messini? Hello everyone, my name is Mersini Trigoni. I'm a senior lecturer in art and design in Leighton Metropolitan University. And I'm also teaching on DMA Fashion Retail Management at the College of Fashion. And my areas of expertise, research and teaching is visual communication, visual analysis through 2D and 3D design and through interior spaces and design and through media, photography and styling. Hey, okay. uh, yeah, and Natasha. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I'm Professor Natasha Radcliffe Thomas. I'm a professor in marketing and sustainable business at the British School of Fashion, which is based within Glasgow Caledonian University. Um, and I have specialist interests in responsible business, um, sustainable fashion and creativity. And I'm really excited that we've got people joining us from all around the world and looking forward to the conversation very much. Great. Um, so uh, firstly, let's talk about the study context. So why did you decide to do this study? Messini, do you mind introducing that? Uh, I think Anna is doing that. Oh, Anna, do you want to <laughs> Yes, sure. <laughs> That's fine, no problem. Um, so we, we first started this, this joint research project. We have actually worked, um, the three of us before, um, in terms of research projects. And then once uh, all of this was unraveling, we thought it would be interesting to to track and to almost like you know look at all this emerging strategy as it was happening so i think we all agree and you've introduced that but, but i think we're living times that um you know kind of living in this kind of unprecedented times and i think this current pandemic has impacted uh greatly in the fashion industry and we see a lot of brands trying to adapt their strategies and business models but we also see that they're actually not just adapting um, and ensuring the sustainability of their structures, but they're also trying to find ways of communicating to their consumers um, in a, that some ways, ways that are more meaningful or that actually have uh, share a different type of message. So we thought it was important to actually track how they are responding because the more brands are able to make this connection, um, you know, the more they're able to actually show support and engage with consumers, uh, create these type of connections, these type of narratives, the better position they will be to survive this crisis. So I think for, you know, for brands that are truly guided by purpose, this is a time where they can actually align the actions with those values. And then, then in the end, hopefully what we will see is that these are the brands that consumers will trust and respect the most. So 
we also felt that we wanted to take a bit of a different perspective because we, you know, we have been watching lots of different uh, webinars and, and talks. And from that industry perspective, there's always a very, you know, there's always very interesting insights that you can take out. But, you know, being academics and being uh, researchers, we thought we could also um, add something else and have, you know, capture insights as they were happening and maybe take a different uh, view in all of these um, in this topic. mentioned about how brands are communicating and I guess one of the key ways we see brands communicate with consumers now worldwide is Instagram. So I think that leads in perfectly to the next question for um, Messina is that why is it important to study about how brands are uh, um, communicating around COVID? Can you hear me? I cannot hear We lost you for a second. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? We yes. can, yes. Perfect. So I was just saying about brands communicating and a key way brands have been able to do this is via Instagram. And so therefore it kind of leads into the next question, which is why is it important to study how brands are communicating around COVID? Hello. Hi, Massini, did you get your question? Sorry. Could, <laughs> Sorry, I lost. I lost connection. Oh, uh, can you, can you, did you hear, Mercini? No. Sorry. Can you just tell us about the Instagram, how we chose the yes. brands. Oh yes. Sorry. I'm sorry. I have a really bad connection today. So yeah. So how we collect the data? So we use interbrand top global brands listing and brand charts, but also Cosmetic Five top beauty uh, brands ranking of 2019. So we analyzed 40 brands in total, 10 from Luxury, 10 from Apparel, and 20 from Beauty. So we track the data from starting from 11th of March, which is the beginning uh, of uh, the beginning of uh, that uh, World Health Organization declared COVID-19 as global uh, pandemic. Uh, so the aim for us was to map and identify if and to what extent and how these brands are responding to COVID-19. So we map the post every week and we also map the visual, the visual text, the verbal message, but also paying attention to the issue of hashtags, comments, like, and we started also identifying the themes. And as we did that week by week, we realized that several themes started um, appearing. And so we managed to identify nine themes across all different these different sectors in fashion and in beauty Great. so you mentioned that you chose the three key themes of fashion luxury and beauty so i was just quite interested as to why you chose to investigate those three themes and um, natasha did you want to answer that yeah, absolutely. So um, as you saw from our introductions, we all work in the areas of fashion and luxury, beauty, um, ma marketing, analysis um, and design. And so really, when we're thinking about something like luxury, it's all about aspiration and quality. And it, we always sort of look to luxury for leadership in terms of what's next and what's the pinnacle, what, where's the heritage, it's a lot about storytelling. Whereas when we look at fashion, it's much quicker, it's much more fun, and it's about putting on and trying new identities. Beauty, I'd say, is more like an internal and external aspect. So it's partly about how we look after our own health and well-being. And it's also about the image that we show the world. But all of those things as well, we, we feel like they operate within a big industry and it's actually big business. And so in terms of how business analyzes, these are sort of discrete areas that we could apply the analysis to. So just you know, linking with what Anna Massini said, it made sense to look at um, brand value mm -hmm. and then see how that developed through through the um, research process fascinating thank you so looking at the um, the instagram post was there a common response that you were seeing from the brand so what are brands posting is it photo shoots product images inspirational quotes are we dealing directly with covid or not um maybe it'd be good to get both of your all of your perspectives on this talking about each key theme that you looked into so maybe anna we can start with you talking about luxury Mm -hmm. So I think my, um, it's interesting because obviously we've been, as Mercini was saying, we've been doing this every week and we track the brands every week and then we kind of discuss it and um, as we go and we've identified a total of nine themes and I think 
those nine themes that Mercini mentioned were um, pretty much connected to beauty, I would say, because uh, interestingly, uh, in terms of luxury, I've realized uh, that the luxury brands haven't had exactly the same response. So for example, three of those, te of those uh, topics and themes are actually, I share those with uh, Natasha and Mercini, but then um, that's pretty much it. So I think it was actually interesting because when it comes to the luxury brands, the majority of the brands that we've looked at haven't shifted their content strategy that much to accommodate the situation. We do have obviously the use of hashtags like stay safe and stay at home, um, you know, but brands such as Tiffany or Cartier or Hermes haven't really um, engaged with the theme um, that, or at least to the extent that we thought they would. So um, we've looked at the other ones that have actually made direct connections and then we've mapped out those, those particular themes. So I can tell you that from the from the luxury perspective, there's three main aspects that have um, that we've noticed. So there's the, you know, there's this aspect about well-being and positivity. How can we offer personal and positive talks? How can we offer this personal support uh, to our followers during this moment? Um, and a lot of it is focused on um, providing entertaining content, ways to cope better at home. So Chanel, for example, has this really interesting. Uh, playlist that they created with a variety of different band ambas brand ambassadors, um, the sound of Chanel, and they obviously they, they promote that to promote their beauty routines. They also do this really interesting um, post of uh, connecting this to a workout exercise called, um, and the hashtag is Mademoiselle Stays Home. So there's a lot of that kind of trying to support followers during the time that they're home. Um, there's another aspect, which is the aspect about the educational um content and that's where they post advice and information about how to go about you know being staying safe and virus protection um and i can talk a bit better after uh using the gucci example because they've, they've definitely been the most engaged in this educational component um but overall i think the um i would say the theme that luxury brands have used the most is community building so showing this strong sense of community supporting uh you know people supporting the healthcare workers so we see a lot of that coming across the the different brands and i think a tendency that i've witnessed with luxury that uh i don't think mercine and natasha have um captured that so much because they are looking at a different segment is this um you know almost this tendency to gravitate towards archive images so relaunch unseen or historic products from these different brands. Um, and I think that pretty much exemplifies the situation we are living in. So we see consumers wanting to, um, to have or this preference for something that is familiar, is comforting. So this nostalgia trend uh, that we see rising in luxury um, is interesting to follow up and see how the other segments will adapt especially in an industry like you know natasha just said in an industry that is so much about novelty and looking ahead how we're now looking back in terms of uh relaunching products to um to make it more familiar for consumers so those three aspects community building education um and positivity were the main themes i've identified within luxury oh, interesting thank you and so Messini, did you find when you were looking at the beauty brands um, were the beauty brands, did they ha share those three aspects of uh, education and community, or did you have different aspects that they were focusing on? Um, apart, to an extent, to an extent, I think the most uh, predominant theme for beauty brands is about sending personal positive supporting messages through the Instagram, Instagram posts. So it was very clear from early from the beginning that they were saying things like we will, put, we will get through this together, your, your health is more valuable than anything else, be safe, be kind. So they will keep posting these positive messages. Uh, and also some of the brands tailor that to the brand identity. For example, Yves Rocher, they will post uh, messages about slowing, slow life and mindfulness with links with our natural products. The second most predominant theme is about supporting communities and also it helps with the beauty brands to donate products and support health workers, support um, uh, uh, groups that they, ne they need for help. The third, the third thing is questions. So brands were, uh, are engaging with consumers through posting questions. And we can see early on that some uh, brands, they take a more humor approach, like for example, Glossier, and they ask the consumers, 
got kind of told them, would you like to see from us? And then their response links with Anna, which consumers, they ask for happy content. They want material that will entertain them, keep them happy, give them solutions on how they can spend time at home with their families. And the fourth uh, thing uh, that again links more with the beauty brands is that some brands, they push products a lot during this time. But uh, again, it links with spending more time at home and we can explain that later on. So for beauty is about positive uh, messages, <coughs> is about supporting communities, questions to consumers to engage and have an interaction, but also promoting and pushing to an extent products. Natasha, did you find the same themes were emerging as well when you were looking instead at the fashion brands? Yeah, the fashion um, segment is interesting because in the top 10 fashion brands, it's mostly dominated actually by the athleisure, which we would probably recognize that a lot of people are wearing athleisure um, more than sort of maybe fashion design clothes. So maybe that's what the, the big difference between the fashion um, sector and luxury. Well, what I would say that was similar across all the brands is that right at the beginning, most of them took a very serious tone. They would have a, tech, a text based message, a post on Instagram that was really about information. It was about supporting, you know, making statements of support to, about their workers, about their community. They were a lot of talk about family and then also saying about closing, about store closures, because remember, we've been living with about three billion people in around the world in some kind of lockdown. So there was a kind of acknowledgement about that. And then brands took their time to kind of decide how they were going to then deal with this in terms of their crisis communications. Um, and I think it's interesting to look at the sort of hashtags that those brands have used or not used, because that really sums up the themes for this um, category. So for fashion, it's been a lot about keeping fit and it's been a lot about sports and teams so the sort of hashtags that they've developed sort of adidas has been using home team um h m which is the fast fashion not the athleisure but the fast fashion they've been using at home with h m under arm has been using ua homework so there's been a lot of different use of that kind of at home hashtag to acknowledge the fact that you know people are, are working from home and, and stay, living in this kind of lockdown and i would say in line with what Massini reported a lot of the um posts have actually been about bringing the community together so they've been a lot about events and as you would imagine that's a perfect fit for the sportswear brands because there have been a lot of home workouts i mean we saw in march that there was a massive increase in google searches for home workouts and so all of the athleisure brands in one way or another have been developing that kind of content all aside from nike that's really interesting thank you so we already touched on a little the main changes in some of those brand communications across the data age. So you're saying you started at the beginning of a lockdown period and looking in, in, into this week. So I think now it'd be really interesting to specifically talk about some of the brands that had the biggest changes. Um, Massini, did you want to just share about some of the beauty brands that you noticed had the biggest changes? Yeah. Um, I think, first of all, I think it's interesting the fact that some brands didn't engage that much uh, on responding to COVID virus. So uh, we have some brands like Root Cosmetics and Anastasia that they hardly end, they had one or two posts uh, related to, to COVID. Uh, we have some brands that they regularly post, like Maybelline, Huda Beauty, Foreo, and then we have some brands that they do it extensively, like Body Soap. I think what has been the change is at the beginning, these brands, they communicate more a positive message and messages around happiness and togetherness. So information, messages about things that can make you happy, quality time with your family, try new recipes, meditate, read. But then as the time progresses, it, the message is more about products, so it's making the most of, the, of staying at home and give your face a deep cleanse or um, information about how you can get ready for your virtual uh, date or your um, online meeting with your friends or colleagues. So we can see this shift from positive, message, positive messages to more product-oriented uh, messages. And um, it's interesting that it took almost a week or two for the beauty brands to start posting relevant, relevant content. And probably this has to do with the fact that uh, the Instagram content is plan ahead, so they needed time to uh, adapt and think about how to respond to that. But, um, and also the other interesting thing is that some brands very quickly stop posting uh, messages, uh, posts around uh, COVID-19. So brands like 
Kali uh, Cosmetics or Clinique stop really quickly. So the last three, four weeks, you don't see as many messages anymore. That's really interesting, um, especially the note of specific brands not really addressing it at all, and then to see the difference compared to some that are really addressing it quite regularly. Um, Anna, did you notice the same with luxury brands? Yes, actually, um, I did. So Mercini just mentioned that they were, you know, we started tracking this data on the 11th of March. Um, one of the uh, one of the brands, or the brand that has been the most active, and actually was one of the um, one of the the first brands to to acknowledge this was Gucci, um, and they've been taking a really interesting perspective. Um, so not just they haven't been the most, I mean, they've been the most active in terms of amount of posts, but also in terms of content of those same posts. So, you know, usually if you follow Gucci on Instagram um, or on any other uh, platform, you, you would have seen that they're quite bold and innovative. Um, they always have this kind of quirky touch to their, um, to their posts. So they have this in terms of, you know, photos, different photo shoots, campaigns, videos, etc. It's all very unique and very, you know, kind of, um, it, it matches the, the DNA of the brand quite well. Um, what was interesting to see is that their first, um, they were, they've been very consistent from the moment they posted that initial post acknowledging the situation. That was on the 24th of March. So from that moment on, they keep on sharing messages of support and the type of of um, aesthetics that they've been using is quite different. So even for a brand like, like Gucci that always has this kind of quirky um, take on things, but they've been using quite graphic images. So they've been using, they've actually been using um, images um, that are from the World Health Organization um, and things like, you know, how to wash your hands, how to be active, how to stay healthy at home. So they're not exactly the type of content that you would expect from a, lux uh, you know, a luxury brand would share. Um, so that's, that has been quite, quite interesting to, to witness how bold they were um, and how consistent they have been in terms of everything else that they've rolled out after that. Great. And I think, Natasha, you mentioned earlier about specific brands using hashtags. I think it was the home team for Adidas. So were there any other brands or that brand specifically that who's um, had a big change over the data range that you were looking at? Yeah, I mean, a brand that's been quite interesting was H&M because they posted a lot, um, but they've had more of a kind of implied relationship with COVID-19. So if you look at the kind of, if you look at the, the page, you don't really get to see what the posts are about because they're all product shots, but you can see that they're actually changing the text. So they still are continuing to have non virus related posts and they have a lot of new product launches, but within the text, you can see that they're starting to put, um, you know, in line with what Massini said, some humorous takes and just you know noting the fact that people are under lockdown so they're kind of H&M at home and they also introduced a sort of at home with H&M challenge and I think that's one of the things that lots of the brands have tried to do is introduce kind of challenges for their uh, followers to get involved with so I think they're visually and aesthetically it's not a big change but I think there was a change in in terms of the tone um, and then for someone like Levi's they've been extremely active and they've had a really big change because they introduced um, a sort of music series so I think it's been interesting for them in terms of it's not been at all product focused so that's a big change for a fashion brand they've started to have just in the last few um, posts a few more product fo focused um, pieces but up until then they've been all about um, a music um, kind of online festival that they've curated and so they've been streaming live music from a whole range of different sources and they've had this 501 kind of music and I think it's been really interesting because they're acknowledging the fact that that's the sort of relationship that their fans have with them that Levi's is really associated with wider popular culture and music specifically and also acknowledging the fact that for those creatives in that area they're also looking at really changed lifestyles with sort of concerts cancelled festivals cancelled and so I think it's been for them kind of supporting a wider creative industry is not just specifically fashion. And, and Natasha, have any of those brands that you were looking at, uh, fashion brands specifically, have they had any limited responses? Like were there any oh, so were there any fashion brands that didn't address the topic at all? Yes, I was really surprised by Zara's <laughs> response. So Zara they haven't completely um, not acknowledged it. There was the, a series of, th I think, three posts in a row where they had a very strange uh, graphic of the Zara logo spreading out and, and coming back together again. And they just had this uh, kind of, it wasn't a hashtag, but it was a statement about respecting social distancing, but staying closer than ever. And they had that, but they, and then nothing else. So none of the other posts, so all of the other posts are just regular fashion 
um, posts and content. And I think that's been quite strange because I'm aware, you know, from other sources that they are actually involved, you know, maybe in uh, donations or, or schemes or whatever. But in terms, um, you know, in terms of that specific Instagram content, you wouldn't know that, that this was going on. That's really interesting then, because in one way that would seem like amazing content to be sharing with their um, audience that they are doing with donations. It seems like a, if you have that content already, it seems really interesting then that they would choose not to. Um, Anna, were there any luxury brands? I think you mentioned a couple earlier yeah. that maybe Hermes has done to yes, you. Actually yeah, definitely. I mean, I share, um, I echo Natasha's um, take on that. I think, you know, there, there are brands that it's almost like we were expecting to see more from them. And, you know, and Hermes is, is definitely one of them, uh, but also Cartier and Tiffany um, and Burberry as well, because, you know, apart from the use of hashtags, obviously, you know, like I've mentioned before, like stay safe or stay at home, um, a brand like Burberry has, has very limited posts acknowledging um, what, has, what is happening and not just acknowledging, but also informing what they're doing you know, behind the scenes, because with Burberry, you know, they're using their global, um, their global supply chain network to fast track the delivery of masks to be used by medical staff. They're actually repurposing uh, trench, coach trench coach factories to make non-surgical gowns. So they've been doing, they've been funding research as well. So they have been doing a lot, um, you know, behind the scenes. But then when you go to their feed, you wouldn't really know that something was happening apart from, I think, three or six posts, I can't remember now. So it's, it has been a very limited response. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, I guess, finding that we have to discuss later on. Um, Messini, I think you mentioned before there was a couple of beauty brands. Was there anything else you wanted to add to that discussion about any of the beauty brands you noticed had quite limited responses? Yeah, I mean, we have one brand like Jeffree Star Cosmetics that we don't have any comment a lot at all about COVID-19. And actually, it was a surprise because it was something that we discussed, the three of us, at the beginning of the research. That the first couple of weeks, we were surprised that the brands and beauty brands do not respond as much as we expected and especially for the beauty brands that it could have been much easier to adapt their content but they still didn't do it to the extent that we thought they, they probably could yeah and were there any posts across the data range that stood out for you for a very high audience engagement were there specific posts that really worked um anna were there any luxury mm -hmm. posts that did really well yeah i think um See, what is interesting, and maybe following up on, on what I just mentioned about that most brands are not really sharing with their followers what they're doing behind the scenes. Interesting enough is that, for example, when they do share this information, we actually no we've noticed that it generates an average number of comments much higher than, um, than the, their normal posts. So it's interesting to see how that sharing that information actually impacts on the engagement rate um, that they have per post. So I can give you an example. On the um, beginning of April, I think the 8th of April, uh, Louis Vuitton posted a photo announcing that they had you know, repurposed several of their ateliers across France to produce um, hundreds of thousands of non-surgical face masks. And that's, that singular post received over 4,000 comments. Um, and keep in mind that this is probably around six or seven times more than the average number of comments that they receive in the other, in the other posts. So, you know, I think followers did engage, or do engage with that type of comment, uh, that type of post, sorry. Uh, by participating in the comments, um, but um, brands haven't been sharing it that much though. But definitely I would say I would highlight that post because I think it was such an interesting um, take in terms of how much that elevated, how much that actually increased the number of comments they had that particular uh, week. And Natasha, did you notice the same with any fashion brands? Did any of those posts really work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the ones, uh, just echoing what Anna said, that, that really got the most engagement were the ones about what brands are doing actively to support either their own sort of smaller community or the wider, especially sort of medical. So for Lululemon, um, one of their posts where they talked about how they were setting up a fund to support their store ambassadors, because I'm not sure people are aware how Lululemon work, but they have a lot of people who work with them doing yoga classes in store. And obviously stores are closed, so that's not happening in that way. So the post when they announced that they were setting up um, an ambassador fund got a lot of interaction. And then Ralph Lauren, um, 
took time, I and mean, obviously in the, it's quite a short time frame anyway, but they took time to, to sort of pull together how they were going to respond to the crisis. But when they did post, they used a really beautiful sort of imagery, rolling fields and greenery, and just made very simple statements about standing together with loved ones, with community, and talked about family. And those kind of posts got a lot of engagement early on. And then, as Anna said, the ones when Ralph Lauren has been really involved with the CFDA in setting up um, you know, lots of you know, um, charitable funds, making them available and, ma and making products and repurposing their, again, their supply chain. And those kind of posts get a lot of interaction. Um, Messini, did you, um, what sort of posts worked well for beauty brands? Um, I think the, the ones that uh, have a humorous content generate a lot of comments. So a brand like Huda Beauty consistently put a uh, humorous post and you can see that the consumers engage with that and, and specifically in one of them. Oh, just a little network problem there. I think we've lost Mercini for a second. Okay, maybe I'll just add because I wanted to add about um, the Lululemon post that got the most interaction was a yoga workout. And I think, you know, a lot of people when in the lockdown have been turning to, you know, fitness, looking after their own health, but also looking for ways to escape and, and kind of get into a different zone. And so yoga has been super popular. So when Lululemon has been posting some guided yoga practices, then those have got a high level of engagement. Welcome back, Messini. We just missed the end of your um, answer. Oh, sorry about that. I was saying that it was expecting humorous posts to generate more um, comments and interaction because it was the kind of post that consumer seems to be asking from beauty brands. And the other category that generated a lot of interactions were um, when brands are posting questions regarding supporting communities. So any post about nominating a health hero will generate many, many comments. And this is something that Olaplex has done, Gliss has done, Gloss Hair. So when consumers were being asked to nominate a health hero, they will very happily do that. And also any post that has to do with... <coughs> Oh, the line from Athens is going down again. Maybe uh, maybe we can move on to the next question and Missy can add back on to that. The next question is going to be beauty is often associated with health and self-care. So on the surface, it seemed like a really an easy switch almost for some beauty brands to adapt if on being at home now, having more time to do um, beauty uh, regimens, for example. So given the different segments that you were looking at, so luxury, fashion, beauty, were there some brands that stood out for you that handled it, this situation like really well? It was just an easy switch to change their marketing communications. Um, Anna, do you want to start with um, talking about luxury? Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, so I've mentioned Gucci before, and I think, you know, I've mentioned that aspect about how they took a very educational approach um, and also how they've been kind of posting different, you know, images that are quite different to the normal luxury aesthetics or imagery that we would expect. Um, so I think, you know, I would definitely say that that is a brand that has um, set them, you know, that set themselves apart. And they've been doing that pretty much around creating this global community. So they've been asking everyone to be a change maker, to stand together. There is that unity message coming through um, very consistently on the, on the Gucci feed. Um, they've also taken a very intimate and quite behind the scenes approach. So the hashtag Gucci community um, is, is basically a series of posts where they choose a variety of different artists, uh, starting with the creative director of the brand, but then moving on to other people that influence the brand and have have an image that is quite related to, to them. And they, they express, you know, messages of empathy and well-being. Um, they show their, you know, they show their, their homes. They make, they, they do videos while at home. Uh, a lot of them, because they're artists, they will be, you know, promoting, well, not promoting, but, you know, showcasing their illustrations, etc. So it's been interesting to see how they still have been able to, um, pass on this message, continue this narrative and educate their consumers about what they should be doing, uh, having that educational stance, but also, uh, but while they're doing that, they are still um, having a very close connection to art 
And, you know, if you have studied luxury before, you know that that connection to art and to uh, this whole, you know, heritage, etc., is something that luxury brands use a lot in terms of communication. So it's been interesting to see how even when they are trying to educate consumers and keep this kind of um, keep this global community going um, when everyone is at home and under the current circumstances, they are still showing that um, interesting take on creativity and creativity definitely, definitely comes across the brand's feed. Um, Massini, uh, don't know if you wanted to chime in with that with some um, insights into beauty brands, whether the beauty brands found that easier or not to, you know, switch their communications. Yes, they, it has been because of the nature of product, definitely. But I think a brand that really stands out is uh, the Body Shop. I mean, it, the volume of posts in total, it, they have 65 posts throughout the two months, which is almost double or even triple from other beauty brands. So it's massive. And also what is interesting about them is, is the consistency of the communication. So they have uh, messages that got posit positive, positive messages, practical advices, questions to consumers, um, but also uh, pushing products to an extent. So it's really interesting, especially the educational uh, element on their post, because they provide many, many advices over coronavirus time. So advices about um, how you can reduce anxiety and, and, pay, uh, and anxiety uh, and stress, uh, several yoga posts in order to reduce tension, meditation in order to keep an optimistic uh, mindset, playlists to dance, relax and unwind. So they have been very, very supported and it really links with their community culture and their ca caring approach. So it makes sense for them to put this kind of content forward. But also questions to consumers, they, they really show a very human and very energetic, positive, friendly approach that again, it links with the brand identity and it makes sense for them. But also they, they really seems, they usually um, use the time uh, uh, in, all, in all in this together, but also time to care, to, you know, to promote this. It's interesting also that, you know, they do several things to help the community. We can discuss this um, later on. But even if they push products, they do it in a more soft way and not to the same extent as other brands. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the messages, the posts that they can, they really promote products is usually one out of five or six posts. So it's not that much compared to other brands. So they predominantly seem to care about the community and post more positive educational um, posts. And Natasha, did you notice that theme as well about care and community working? Were there any fashion brands that mm. seem, um, seem to find it very easy to switch? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the brands that's um, been able to create a lot of content that is visually pleasing and is kind of on message in terms of the brand identity is Ralph Lauren. And if you've watched the recent documentary about Ralph Lauren, I mean, and if you, how familiar you are with the brand, you'll know that they have a lot of different product ranges, but they're also a lot about Ralph Lauren as a person and the extended members of, of the family. And so their hashtag RL at home has been a lot about, you know, reminding us to care for ourselves, for our family, what's important now. But it's also been able to provide a little bit, as Anna was saying, with the more luxury segment, the kind of behind the scenes thing. So it's sort of, you know, Ricky's recipes, or here are some books that we're reading, here's some flower arranging we're doing and it's you know brought in sort of an entertainment and engagement and distraction whilst all the time kind of reinforcing the Ralph Lauren aesthetic and if you've been to any of the stores and you know that their visual merchandising is such a key important part of the whole brand image and so all of these posts are really reinforcing that so I mean I think they they're a brand um, where it's worked really well and I, as I already mentioned all the the brands that are to do with sports and, and athleisure then it's kind of an easy it's been an easy switch for them to work with their brand ambassadors so that they can provide these sort of workouts or motivations and etc and so I think for most of those brands they, they found that switch really um, easy as opposed to someone like the North Face, who really they're an outdoor brand so it's been quite hard I think for them to so in the most point they've kind of steered away from that or that they've talked about you know when we get back what's going to happen so I think now when we're in a slightly different stage where people are starting to imagine the the next stage I think they're they're one of the brands that, that are starting to be able to have a bit more content. It's really interesting it must be quite diff challenging that like you're saying for North Face and probably some other brands that rely on really their in-store 
ambience almost to communicate that with consumers how do you then do that digitally it's really interesting so i think we've all been seeing like quite a lot of coverage especially in media about fashion brands making ppe or like gowns or hand sanitizer such as lvmh producing hand sanitizer so just interested if there are any other kind of initiatives that the brands are supporting that really stood out for you maybe you could give an example from each of the key themes natasha was there one in fashion that stood out to you yeah, I mean, I already talked about what Ralph Lauren were doing, but actually Adidas, I think quite cleverly, they talk about how their investment in research and development innovation means that they've been able to apply the same technologies that they use for their own products to be able to pivot and make 3D printed face shields. That's really interesting. Anna, did you notice any of the brands in luxury supporting yes, specific um, initiatives? So uh, you've mentioned, Babette, you've just mentioned the, um, you know, LVMH producing hand sanitizers um, and definitely the LVMH group and the caring group, they've both been quite active. Um, and although, as I said before, that's not coming across so much on the feed of the, the brands within the, each group, um, we, we have noticed that definitely that is something that they've been engaged with. So, you know, they've been providing all sorts of protective gear to healthcare workers. Um, they've also been donating to to charities they've been participating and um, engaging in crowdfunding campaigns uh, they've been funding research and you know and overall they have been using their supply chain networks to make sure that they assist or they fast track this the, the delivery of this type of equipment to be used by by um, you know health health workers so we've seen a lot of, of that and also the repurposing of factories, as I mentioned before, um, and that's the case with um, Louis Vuitton and Burberry, amongst others, how they've been repurposing their factories to actually um, assist in the production of um, non-surgical gowns. Um, Messini, did you notice any beauty brands uh, specifically mm -hmm. uh, supporting an, um, an initiative like these, for example? I mean, as, as it, it is expected, many beauty brands donate hygiene products, so either to hospitals or to communities in need, in shelters and senior citizens' homes. What is interesting is that also we have um, um, brands supporting the industry while the beauty salons are closed. So Olaplex opened a new affiliate, so affiliate program to support stylists that are out, out of work right now. And then to Two campaigns really stand out for me. First of all, it's MAG, which formed the Viva Glam 100% Giving campaign, which is in line with the MAG, MAG Viva Glam uh, Giving model. So in this case, when the, um, a customer purchases the lipstick, all the proceeds going back to the COVID-19 relief. And by that, they are able to support 250 organizations worldwide. So they can provide tests to Peru, they can support people in Haiti, they can support hospitals in uh, North Italy. And the other initiative that really stands out for me is when beauty brands really support uh, meta health and is really fighting against domestic violence. So you have brands like Maybelline who have partnered with Crisis Text, text Line for anyone battling with anxiety in this period and it's interesting how people can text 24-7 uh, to get support and uh, it's interesting also how Body Shop is fighting against domestic violence and they promote the hashtag isolated not alone and they give practical advices on what you need to do how to develop a plan how to communicate that actually you are in danger and also they have partnered with no more organization to support consumers. So, and again, it's in line with their social activism approach and they're supporting and human rights, supporting nature as well of the brand. So it's very in line with their branding. <clears throat> Um, great, thank you so much for sharing such interesting insights. I think just to wrap up now for the next five minutes or so, it would be great like to focus on some key takeaways. So like, what is the most surprising thing you all found from this study? Um, Anna, what was the most surprising thing you found mm. in luxury? I think, um, I think we probably all hinted at that a little bit. We were expecting that we were going to have tons of posts to code. Uh, to be honest. Um, so we were expecting a lot more engagement um, from brands, from these leading brands. Um, so I think definitely witnessing, you know, I was looking at luxury and witnessing that the pillars of communications remain very focused on how 
the traditional pillars of luxury communication are like, you know, communicating an aspirational way of living, uh, collection launches, like travel, celebrity endorsements, and these kind of references to art and creativity, craftsmanship and heritage that was still there. And not a lot of brands shifted or adopted it. Um, so I think um, that has been a surprising finding, especially because I think, you know, with luxury, uh, it's such a high involvement product that we understand that definitely, you know, so much of the experience is physical, but obviously they are using the, the digital and social media to communicate. So we thought um, that with such a high involvement product that, you know, obviously consumers are going to have a much higher expectation. Uh, and we thought brands would have a, um, a, a, would actually adopt a much more proactive behavior in terms of a communication strategy to acknowledge the situation we are living. So I would definitely say that this kind of, I wouldn't say lack of engagement, but um, poor engagement coming from some leading um, luxury houses. Great. And Natasha, did you um, want to add anything to that? Yeah, just to really quickly, I mean, I was just surprised that if you look on the surface for lots of the brands, you wouldn't even notice that we were in this situation. Yeah. <laughs> Messini, was it the same for you? I mean, I, I agree totally with Natasha as well, uh, with Anna, that also, you know, I would expect much more for beauty brands. And I was surprised how, to what extent some brands, they take advantage of the situation to really promote their products and they use hashtags like makeup and stay, stay in or a spa at home, facial at home, say so they keep, they take, they you they tap into the fact that people working from home and um, meeting people online and they really try to, to promote the products alone. So through hashtag, but also through their messages is very clear. Great. And um, during our, your really interesting talk, we got quite a few interesting questions. So maybe we can uh, have a look at those that came in uh, through the chat box. So I'll read these out to uh, the panelists. Um, so we've got quite a few interesting comments about personal playlists being interesting. Um, one question here is, what's the best or your favorite marketing COVID adapted campaign you've seen in each of the categories and why? Did you have a personal favorite? Um, who would like to go first? Uh, Natasha, did you know? Um, I just think a post that stood out was H&M when they had a banana printed dress and it was to wear while everyone's at home making banana bread. It's not necessarily my favourite, but I think it was quite clever. Anna, did you notice anything like that? Um, I wouldn't say like a, an adapted campaign, but there, there was one post actually recently from Dior that I think was really interesting and clever because, you know, I've just, I mentioned before, so much of luxury communication is about like craftsmanship and, um, and how this kind of savoir faire of doing things. And they've actually, they've posted photos of the, um, of the artisans that work for them at home doing like embroidery in an haute couture dress. And I thought, you know, some of them have their kids around and everything. So I thought it was a really clever way to acknowledge that craftsmanship and yet keep it quite, um, you know, interesting from a, from a visual perspective. Oh, that sounds lovely. I definitely want to check that out after this talk. And <laughs> Messini, did you notice any great ones on beauty? I mean, what I found interesting is how the, um, the graphic style and animated ca cartoon style that Body Shop used in some of, um, some of the posts, even if the message is about having a guest balance, the way they communicated it was very cheerful, uh, friendly and positive. So it's interesting to see how they play with the graphic style to promote um, to communicate a message that may be difficult for somebody. Okay, got another question here. And do you, uh, maybe this is more for Natasha because it's about fashion brands. Um, do you think fashion brands should focus on product marketing or brand marketing during the crisis? I think the product marketing has fallen a little bit flat. And I think it's been really interesting to see that amongst the athleisure brands, a lot of them have posted, you know, home workouts and clearly people are wearing the brand, but they're not actually posting about it and in the text whereas some of the brands I think it was Under Armour always did and so and so is wearing this and I felt that that was a little bit sort of unnecessary so I think it's been really you know where and I think that's why Zara and Uniqlo both have had a bit of a problem because I mean we don't go to them for comfort and community and nurturing we kind of go to them for convenience and for, for fast fashion basically and for new new looks so I think it, that's why it's been difficult for them to actually adapt so as I say Zara seems to have ignored it um, Uniqlo just recently have started 
started to acknowledge the fact that people are working from home and etc but it's almost a bit late to the game so I think in all instances it's kind of important to focus on the core brand identity um, and when you have a strong identity that's when you're able to do that and really that's at the, the core of this research but super interestingly the top fashion brand in this category is Nike and they have had minimal posts although I know again outside Instagram they've been doing a lot of work so I mean you know when we get to the end of this and we have a, a, an evaluation of the findings it's going to be really interesting to look and see how we think these things have interplayed. I think it's just just building on on what Natasha just said it's actually I think that's been the key takeaway for me as well is that you know how We've all heard, you know, we've all been discussing sustainability in the fashion industry for, for quite a few years now. But it's interesting to see how um, these, this is actually the time where from brands have to actually make a commitment to sustainability and show where their true purpose lies. So I think that's when it becomes quite natural for them to communicate and it doesn't seem forced at all because we know these brands are, are responsible outside of, you know, of this kind of Instagram fee that we're looking at. So that's when that, that, that is almost natural. That, that sh for that shift to happen, it's quite natural. So it's been, it's been interesting that. And we've got a couple more comments. Um, someone said it's really interesting to see how much the posts have changed over time. And oh, it's on Joseph. Hi, Joseph. Um, even though it's quite a short period from March to now, he said it would be really interesting to like carry on looking past this period to see uh, how the posts and messages and, or imagery continue to evolve beyond the current period when cities begin to reopen. I think that would be really interesting. Um, another question here, someone's recently submitted their PhD, oh congratulations, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> you all know how hard that is, exploring online behaviours in the context of green clothing. I would be interested to hear what method you use to collect online data and the challenges you face when collecting data online. I think um, we touched on this right at the start of this um, and any tips for academics collecting data online in the future? Massini, did you want to answer that one? Yes, I mean, as I said, we have, uh, we have, um, uh, we system systematically, systematically collect the data once a week. And we plan also uh, to go back uh, after, um, when we decide to complete the process, to go back and see the increments in comments and see how much they have increased. Because um, I think Anna has mentioned that they, uh, there is a research that proves that uh, the comments doesn't change much after 24 hours. So we're going to check uh, if there is an increase in comments after this period. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I'd add was that we, you know, the selection of what you're actually going to track. So that was, you know, um, Anna came up with the whole idea of the project to start with. And then we decided that looking at across all social media is like way too much, but Instagram is the most sort of the key communications tool so it was you know cho you're narrowing down what you're actually looking at and, and how you're collecting um, and so we decided we you know we've collected the imagery we've collected the comments we weren't at the moment super interested in what people were saying it was more like the number of comments yeah. and you know likes mm. and views and that kind of thing and just um, and then we've developed a, a, a way of how we're going to analyze and develop our own themes from it yeah. but I think um, you know, there's a few articles out there around this, but also I think it's, it's quite a new and developing area, this kind of research. So we'd be happy to hear about anyone else's experiences as well. And also I think it's a matter if you want to focus on the social engagement, on how consumers engage on, on, on this post, or if you want, for example, to focus on analyzing the visuals of this post. So there's different angles depending on what you want, um, what you want to, to achieve through this research. Definitely. Um, quite a big question here that I think all three of you can address or one of you can do. Um, from Kat, she asks, uh, what do you think the post-pandemic fashion industry will look like? And what role will social media play in a new fashion industry, maybe? Okay, I think for the um, fashion category is really well placed because apart from the fast fashion piece the sort of the where the successes have been are in these sort of athleisure brands and I think there's already evidence that people are focusing a lot on their health their fitness and so I think they've got this sort of opportunity there um, to really engage with this sort of ch maybe changing consumer lifestyle and attitudes and I think with a lot of people having thought about that and also people have been 
at home a lot wearing those types of clothes. So although there's going to be a little bit of a desire to dress up and be back in your heels maybe, but I think actually a lot of people will have realised how pleasant it might be to wear comfortable, functional clothes. So I think there's going to be some opportunities there. Um, and I think the brands that people have felt happy with and have turned to under this that you know and who've behaved well and who have you know been responsible businesses have supported their community including their own employees i think it would be nice to think that those brands get supported by um you know by customer loyalty but i think that there's really a big piece to come from um you know governments uh, internationally to see how we can support such an important industry because obviously it already was a challenging um you know it was already challenging circumstances and i think we've got a lot of questions about what the future of retail going to look like mm -hmm. because although you know there's a lot of online purchasing going on we saw not within the brands in this study but there have been people who've really suffered through lack of online you know transactional sites and etc um and also you know it's just <coughs> what is shopping going to look like what are people even going to be interested in fashion what do they want from it so i think there's a lot but also i think we'll just see that the trends that we're already starting are going to continue i don't think there's going to be a complete mind shift from most people if you, if you look to yourself you you're not going to completely change your style and way of living I doubt. Um, so I think the trends for people would do already doing a lot of simplifying their lives and decluttering. I think that might continue a little bit as Anna already talked about sustainability. A lot of people want to make more ethical choices in their clothing. So I think there might be more demands placed on business, but it's going to be difficult for business to answer all of the different asks of it. I think without some um, kind of fundamental support from institutions. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's been, you know, there's almost like you can, you can look into two different aspects. You can look at the aspect of brand communications and how will this look like? And I think we, um, at least speaking from the luxury perspective, we're definitely seeing a lot more um, re a return to a more meaningful tone and message in terms of communication. So it's almost like you, there's this shift towards a more, um, you know, more empathy and a human centered communication. So it's not just about deciding which campaigns work from a visual um, aspect, but also does the you know does this particular campaign have a purpose? Um, what we are doing, what is the impact that uh, all our activities have? So you know we we talk about profit, people, and planet, but definitely we need to talk about adding purpose as well because it's 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 this kind of connection and, and how we bring this narrative together. Um, and if you look at luxury, you know we've got fashion weeks cancelled, postponed. YSL just say just announced uh, a couple of weeks ago that they'll they'll develop a new calendar. They won't be showing at Paris Fashion Week. So the pace of luxury has to slow down. Um, it's almost immoral, right, to request novelty every month or more than once a month. But then on the other hand, valuing this craftsmanship um, that sometimes spans across generations. So we, there has to, you know, there's something, I think, you know, I agree with what Natasha said. Um, there, we have seen this movement towards a more sustainable way of living, you know, like we've all noticed being home that we can live with a lot less purchases. Um, and I think businesses will adapt. And, and whether that comes from, um, you know, different types of, of business models that will emerge, like the made to order, Order, for example, the rental. Um, so all of these things will have to uh, will have to start being um, adopted in a much more mass scale than they have so far. And I think for beauty brands, I think there is a uh, room to, for to think about how they have responded to this uh, COVID nineteen um, situation and being more sensitive to social issues, but also being more supporting and listening to the consumers. I think there is room for brands that did it well to build on that and the, for brands that haven't responded as much to consider if there is room um, to adapt their strategy. And just to add about fashion media as my industry, I think fashion media itself was suffering a lot before this virus about a role of um, what's the purpose of fashion media now? What role does it play anyway? And I think um, this has really thrown it into the light now. Um, and unfortunately, quite, there's been quite a lot of closures or magazines being postponed or people being furloughed. Just news about Condé Nast yesterday. So um, I think it's going to be really interesting in one way to see how fashion media will adapt past this. Um, okay, I'll crack on with the next few questions. Uh, one in from Jason here says, once the lockdown has been lifted in the UK, how would you define the new normal landscapes between high street and luxury market sectors? Do you think that relationship or how those areas are defined will change? 
I think people have been considering what reconsidering what what is a luxury as Anna said I think a lot of people have thought about that I think a lot of people have questioned maybe their past consumption choices I think one advantage that luxury will have is that it has the higher value on transactions and so in terms of we I already mentioned retail it's going to be easier as we've seen in China with the luxury stores reopening and having appointment systems and having social distancing that's going to be a lot easier for luxury brands than it would be um, you know for, for fashion for regular sort of mid-market sort of brands um, so I think that that's going to be one of the big challenges is what does that look like and also I mean the slowing down that Anna talked about I think that's something again that the, the fast fashion brands are going to be considering how you know how do they actually adapt to that so we don't you know we've seen orders cancelled we've seen uh, you know consumers not being happy about whether people are being paid and treated well along the supply chain so even if it's still a minority of consumers engaging in that kind of activism against the current system I think we're looking for inspiration for doing business in better ways and I think people will be a lot happier about that so there's certainly lots of challenges there's lots of space for innovative thinking and I hope that, that kind of a more positive model emerges and also if just to add a thing in terms of retail design maybe we will see in the future more um, flexible and adaptable spaces because uh, people I'm not sure for how long we will need to, to keep this uh, social distance while we're shopping but maybe retail spaces cannot be more adaptable so if in the future there are other changes they will be much easier to for, for me, formulate the store source for people to shop around mm -hmm. and also i think on the digital um, aspect as well because obviously digital uh, we've got a we have a lot of brands that have this kind of born digital and, and, and global and I think when we look at luxury that sorry when we look at beauty that is definitely one of the segments where digital and the whole like direct to consumer has prospered the most but luxury wasn't exactly an early adopter of digital so I think now it will be interesting to see how some brands will have to adapt to a world where um, digital plays a much bigger part and will play an even bigger part in the future. That leads perfectly into your next question from the audience, from Rebecca. She's noticed with some brands, fashion, such as uh, Levi's and also Beauty, Mac, and um, they're using AI now for people to try clothes or lipstick on. Do you think that this is the way forward? Did you notice anything like this in your findings? To be honest, it's been really interesting for me. I think most of the kind of posts have actually not really um, gone down that road at all. They haven't been about any of those digital innovations. They have, they've been much more about human connection and they've been much more, you know, as I said, like the challenges. So either joining in with a fitness challenge or H&M and people turning over their feed, you know, asking people to post with, with you know, their H&M fashion challenge and then they're showing, uh, they had a really nice post this week, Wednesday is, is big sleeve day or something, which suited me, I've got big sleeves on today um, <laughs> and so I think it's, I it, it's interesting that actually hasn't been an aspect but that is it one of the trends that I was mentioning as things that were already happening are going to continue so definitely that's something and I think you know as Massini just said if we're thinking about how we present things differently that's going to obviously offer an opportunity I mean one of the things I was thinking um, that might suffer actually is this idea of rental because people are going to be much more fixated on hygiene aspects mm -hmm. and so anything where it's going to be secondhand um, or sharing I think that is something that's going to have a challenge to, to prove um, you know the, the cleanliness etc so I think in a way those things that have were all just starting to bubble up and we had a lot of buzz about them I wonder how they're actually going to adapt now I think people are going to be much more conscious about what they're touching and bringing into the home for a little while until hopefully this is over uh, regarding the beauty brands in the um, Instagram post, they haven't been much mentioned on technology, but I think definitely it's going to be part of the store design in the future and I think the coming months and years, uh, incorporating more applications in order to pre-order, pay products in, while you are in store so you don't have to touch anyone, contactless, self-service areas, uh, uh, technologies as to make it easier for you to try to try outfits so I think it will be more something that will happen in the future so it hasn't been mentioned uh, on Instagram post right now. 
Yeah, I think on this particular piece of research or this particular project we're working on, technology isn't, I mean, technology when it comes to AI um, isn't something that came across, um, that we came across that much, um, especially for luxury. That, that, I mean, that has, it's not something that has been mentioned. We do know that a lot of luxury brands are working um, and trying to implement a lot more technology in their um in their structures but and you know and other types of whether it's for to improve the, the the whole aspect around like sizings and fitting when purchasing online whether it is to create a much more immersive retail environment um or to develop for example that made to order i've i've talked about before but definitely it's not something that we have noticed in this particular project Great, thank you. Uh, a couple more questions here. Do you think that the brands will stick to the same theme that you notice of educational posts or community building posts for the rest of the time period? Because as this person points out, like we don't know how long a COVID virus will last. So or what do you think the brands will adapt to next? Do you think it'll be pro uh, it's probably digital fashion, for example? I think that they're starting already to do future kind of looking and the kind of hopefulness and the when we get back to you know a little bit of life of normality so I think as I said already the sort of active wear brands that are more outdoorsy are sort of almost giving people tastes of you know we'll get back to this and, and thinking about that so um, I think they'll probably uh, gauge how successful some of the kind of community engagement things have been and so some of the you know the live challenges the yoga things the workouts i think they'll probably try to ramp up on those as they see people as i said interested in fitness and health but i think some of the things will fall away as people have more and more cause and, and when people are not all working from home i don't think those posts will be so relevant so i think we're already seeing a little bit of dilution i think those you know those posts that are about building a community when it comes to luxury they will remain not with the same message obviously but you know luxury has always had this um tone and, and kind of way of communicating that is pretty much about kind of this this uh, community and this shared you know shared values the art um, as I mentioned before this connection this connection to art and creativity so there was a lot of brands that already had that as a pillar of communication when it comes to showing you know interesting people interesting figures brand ambassadors that might be a bit you know out of the box in terms of what you might consider so I, I think that will remain creating this global community of, of people that kind of like think alike uh, and that value the craftsmanship and that heritage of the brands but obviously it, it all depends on how this situation will um, will evolve and I think for beauty brands, uh, the brands that they have as part of your branding and strategy, the community focus, social activist approach, like um, body shop or influencer, probably they continue that but they, for a little bit more. But the others, the beauty brands have already started shifting their interest and presenting other content. So I don't think they it's going to continue for all of them. It's more about the brand that is part of their core brand identity. Great, um, just two more questions here. Um, one of our listeners is currently working on the dissertation, tracking uh, an American department store versus a French department store and their Instagram content during the coronavirus. And the goal is to use this process as a measurement to deliver value to their customers. How do you think brands should deliver value to their consumers or followers um, through Instagram during this time? I think it varies a little bit from brand to brand um, as we already kind of talked about it I think it depends what the deal is with your followers so I think it's interesting you know when we compared the luxury fashion and beauty that we that they actually had different perspectives it's not a surprise but I mean something like the use of humor for example was not really um, at all visible in the the luxury in the fashion area but much more in the beauty so but i think you know one of the things i think has been interesting this is, is seeing kind of how brands have responded to their own employees and and how that has been seen as a bit of and their business model and their their charitable you know how they've pivoted and done donations and seen that those sorts of things are ways of adding value and increasing kind of brand reputation so i think that sort of idea of being a responsible business that that anna mentioned already i think that's been something um, but also I think it's interesting to see how people have chosen to use Instagram and I think a really interesting analysis would be to look at some of the brands that were not so engaged with this on Instagram in their different um, ways of communication and where they actually put those messages because I think what you'll find is brands use a whole stream of communication 
tools and platforms and they choose different strategies for each of them. But I think certainly, I don't think there's been too many missteps, but I think there've been some lost opportunities from brands who just didn't really know how to, how to work ar around this. And that might be as well because some of their staff were furloughed. I mean, who knows, you know, with some of this thing, maybe the people making the content um, were first to go. Yeah. I think to, my my feeling is that I think to an extent some brands may even be confused or, 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 or what kind of content is appropriate right now. So that's why I think some brands that have more friendly approach, they have been able to actually pose questions on what would you like to hear from us right now because it's I mean, we know it's stressful and confusing. Well, I didn't get that so much in the luxury brands about <laughs> what, what content you would like to see from us because it's just a way of communication that doesn't work for them. But I do think, you know, and, and um, I, the question was actually mentioned specifically department stores, which we know is, is a format that has been struggling um, a lot. Of. And I think that is particularly interesting because we know of a lot of brands, especially in um, the luxury and premium sector, where, you know, there's a lot of designers that have their orders cancelled from department stores, etc. So it might be interesting as well to see how, you know, department stores are actually communicating their commitment when it comes to to supporting designers, whether small or, you know, or, or, or bigger brands, and how they are showing that support and that commitment throughout um, this, whole, this whole period and actually even after. So I think it's a, a way to deliver value to their followers can definitely be that, you know, being able to show support um, and being able to, to stay true to, um, to your company in terms of what your values are and how you promote that throughout the um, activities that you develop. And Anna, I have one question here for you about luxury and I think you just touched on um, this now, maybe it's one more thing you would like to add to this, mm -hmm. but what do you think consumers are expecting from luxury brands in terms of communication to them? Yeah, yeah, I mean I briefly mentioned before but I think we yeah, I think there's there's two aspects. I think there's the physicality of luxury. So you know, there's something about the 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 luxury um, environment that can't yet be completely replaced by um, the online tools that we have. So I think once we are back to this new normal, whatever that new normal is, I think we will see a lot of that um, tendency to go into stores, to have this connection, to have this experience, this personal connection, um, this individual experience with brands, with what they stand for, and be fully immersed in this, um, you know, in this luxury environment. Um, but then on the other hand, I think in terms of communication, the brands that have shown more empathy and the brands that have shown that actually their followers and their consumers actually sit at the core of their content strategy are the ones that are definitely better positioned to succeed in the, in the future because they demonstrate that trust and that commitment. Um, and I think consumers don't forget that. And I think that, you know, once this all passes, I think that is definitely the brands that consumers will come back to and the ones that they will remember as the ones that actually did, had a positive um, behavior and were actually true to, to, their, um, to their values. Great, thank you. Uh, one last question here um, from a first year PhD student. Um, due to the COVID-19 outbreak, most of the fashion brands that need to digitize, which we've been talking about for the last hour now, they're uh, more, uh, sorry, they need to digitalize their business more than before. Do you think DTC, direct to consumer, will be a new trend or a new normal of the fashion industry? I know I've seen DTC emerging as a really key trend in Chinese beauty, but do you, have you noticed that at all? I think people have really got used to um, in the sort of lockdown situation how, consuming things in a different way and, and accessing them in a different way and people have been really you know from things being in shortages for the idea of rationing which for, for many of us we've been in a lucky position to not have considered those kinds of things but this way of getting products to you you know just to your doorstep has will probably really change uh, how we feel about accessing products but also I think you know networks and supply chains that have been set up will be able to be open up to that and I think there'll be a lot of question of someone asked the question about value before there'll be a lot of question about what the value is of the you know of the middle experience and I think Messina had some interesting things to say about the retail experience the physical retail experience so I think there'll be a lot of opportunities to have that or to have this kind of direct to consumer so yeah I think we'll definitely see a lot more of that. But I think probably probably brands will um, will 
will wait and see how that goes. I don't think they will invest right now on something that's going to be too expensive before they know if it's going to be last for the long run. I think when it comes to luxury as well, that investment that Mercedes just discussed, you know, wholesale is such a big part of the luxury industry in terms of that point of sale for consumers that I think um, it's, it will be interesting to see how some brands will have to adapt. And obviously we're not talking about the bigger names, but the smaller and more premium in terms of um, segment, how they, um, you know, how they will have to adapt their structures because they might have suffered um, losses in this process that they can't, exactly, you know, that they can't keep their, their businesses going. So I think direct to consumer is definitely a key trend and will be uh, when we're talking about certain segments. Uh, in terms of luxury, because the cost of implementing and the cost of actually setting up a, um, you know, a luxury business and, and everything that it entails from, from the whole supply chain to the way you communicate, etc., uh, then it becomes a bit um, harder to, to, to do. But there have, you know, there's been some really interesting examples of brands that started in that more premium sector uh, in this diet and this D2C uh, business model and have actually evolved. Um, so I think with luxury that retaining a direct-to-consumer only model is trickier because of the weight that wholesale has and still has um, in this in this particular segment. And just, uh, I think that wraps up all our questions from today. Just one last person was asking how we could f they could find out more information about this project. Am I right to think that Anna, you've published an article on your own LinkedIn profile that's okay. public that everyone can go and have a look yes, at for more yes. information? Yeah, it's just a, very, a bit of a tease, it's really a teaser because at the moment, so we, we, we've developed that LinkedIn article and I've posted it on my, on my profile, uh, but I think Natasha and Mercini have also shared it. And that just gives you a bit, of an, a bit more of an overview of the, um, the research that has been ongoing for the past two months. We are now starting to look at uh, how we are going to convert all that data into a bigger piece of research on like a full length article. Um, and once that happens, we, you know, we'll, we'll be glad to inform everyone. Great. Well, thank you so much to the three panelists today, thank three you. fashion academics. And that was fascinating and one amazing inaugural launch to the Fashion Research Open Talk. So, and thank you all for tuning in today and thank you all for your amazing questions. I hope you all stay safe and well. Thank you for listening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care.